Well, I am going to talk to you about, um, uh, just take one of those and pass it around, about uh, Sanskrit and, and where we find Sanskrit and the cultural basis of Sanskrit. Um, Sanskrit is an ancient Indian language that um, the earliest form of which we have uh, is probably from somewhere around 1600 BC, 1600 BC. So the oldest surviving examples of Sanskrit, the oldest surviving ones, they, we know there are older ones because the surviving ones tell us that. The oldest surviving ones are 3,600 years old. Uh, it's, it's a very, very ancient language. And it's a language very closely related to your own language. Here is India. And the people who, who spoke Sanskrit, Sanskrit isn't spoken very much anymore. It's like Latin. People know it, but they don't go to the market and buy carrots using it. Uh, it's the same sort of thing with Sanskrit. Sanskrit is an Indo-European language. You may not know, but languages are related to one another. So Spanish and French and Italian. If you know Spanish really well, you can understand Italians. Maybe not know exactly what they're talking about, but you can know the general topic they're talking about. If you know French, same way. If you know German really well, you can make sense of English and vice versa. And the reason for that is that all of these languages came from an original language that was spoken thousands and thousands of years ago. And there's a lot of debate about how long ago. But we think that sometime around 3000 BC, 3000 BC, so 5000 years ago, something happened in this region of the world here that caused the people to migrate out. Maybe a natural disaster, maybe a war, we don't know. And those people migrated out of the central Caucasus area <coughs> of Russia, and they migrated east as far as India, and west as far as Iceland. So Sanskrit is one of the oldest Indo-European languages. You may say, well, how do we know that these languages are related? And there's two ways that we know. One is the words that we find in all these languages. And the other one is the structure of the grammar. All those boring grammar lessons that you had in fourth and fifth grade turn out to be really important when you're comparing the evolution and the migration of languages. What am I holding up here? A hand, right. Does anybody know the German word for hand? Hunt, exactly. Spelled exactly the same. Foot, eye, hair, all parts of the body, because that's one thing everybody's got in common. Hands, eyes, hair, feet, etc. All of these words are similar. So in Sanskrit, for example, the word for hand is hata. It's not, it's not a th in Sanskrit. There's no th in Sanskrit. It's ta, hata. So the word for elephant, a very common word in Sanskrit, is the one who has an extra hand. So it's a hati, or a trunk. Sometime around 1500 BC or so, there was a migration from Iran into northern India. Now the people who did, the, who did this, who were involved in this migration, had a name for themselves. They referred to themselves like most tribal migratory uh, peoples as the good people. And the word for that The word for that is Aryan. Now, how many of you have heard of, heard this word before? Does it evoke wonderful, warm feelings for you? No. It has been it has been captured 
by a particular political perspective, uh, and it really grows out of Nazi Germany, where the Germans began to talk about racial purity, and they wanted to go back to the oldest element of their racial stock that they could identify, and that is this term Aryan. They also did something else pretty nasty for, uh, for India. They took one of India's most precious and, and uh, warm symbols of good luck and turned it into something pretty awful. This is swastika, exactly. So you all know Sanskrit because <laughs> Swastika means good fortune. And it's a perfectly good Sanskrit word. It's absolutely not been modified at all. The Nazis appropriated this symbol to represent their racial purity, etc., that goes back to this Aryan business. But none of that means anything in India. So you will find swastikas all the time in India. As, as sort of like four-leaf clovers. It's simply a sign of good luck. In fact, the house that I live in, here in Eugene, was built in 1925. And in the entryway, there's a sort of small tiles. And around the edge of the tiles are symbols of good luck. There's clovers and designs, etc. And there are two swastikas here. And it makes people pretty nervous to come in the present sense. It's on the floor, but it's a sign of good luck, not of Nazism. How many of you have ever memorized a poem? Good. And um, how long was the poem that you memorized? Not very long. Not very long? What? 50, 60 verses? <laughs> Two. Maybe two verses? Yeah, I'm in the same, I have the same disability. These books I'm handing around here are books that are, they're very technical uh, topics. One of them is on, on a very focused area of law and the other one's on philosophy. If you were a student and you wanted to come and study with a traditional teacher, study one of these topics, you would <coughs> memorize that book before coming to class. And the admissions exam would be for me to take that book like this and take a piece of metal called a, called a hook, stick it in the book, randomly flip it open and start to read. And I would start to read and then I would say, now you. And you would have to pick up the text and recite it from memory. And that would be your admissions test. If you could do that well enough to satisfy me that you really had memorized this, you can come to the class. And now, we'll look at that book together to figure out what it means. Understand the topic, etc. And that's just for one class. The capacity for human memory is staggering. And we've lost it. And it's getting worse. <laughs> Most of you don't know your friends' telephone numbers, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because there are, we've got a program. We have come to rely on all kinds of technology to supplement our ability to memorize. But I'm telling you, we have the capacity for astonishing amounts of memory. Now, this is important for the Sanskrit tradition because most of Sans Sanskrit's history, it was an oral liter literature. What do we mean by this? We mean poems, technical literature, art, works on art, works on law, were all composed, but composed orally and passed on orally. Now, you're not going to be able to relate to this at all. But the way that you studied with a teacher originally in India was to sit face to face with that teacher and the teacher would put his hand on your head and begin to recite. And he would recite and move your head in rhythm to the verse. So that you'd have a physical 
aid to your memory as well as the, as the oral input. And the, thing, the most important things that they would transmit, of course, were religious texts. Texts for the successful conduct of sacrifices and uh, uh, incantations for rain and good luck and the birth of children, etc. And you would memorize these perfectly. Not pretty closely, perfectly. Because if you didn't memorize them perfectly, and you tried to recite them, they wouldn't have the magical effects. That was the belief, that was the religious belief. These earliest texts that we have from about 1600 BC are religious texts that the Indians, the Hindus, think contains all of human knowledge. Everything that's worth knowing is in these texts, and those texts are eternal. Now this means that there's something about this language that is more than language. It has, it has a presence in the universe, a power in the universe, that's different than just any, any other kind of language. So just speaking the language, just articulating the sounds, gives you some participation in the eternal nature of the universe. And so the words that are composed by this take on greater power than just conveying what you want to, whatever meaning you want to place in them. And the Indians thought a lot about this. And we tend not to think about it. But one area where we can have some access to this is the fact that I can hurt anybody in this room far worse by saying things that I can physically. Punch you in the nose, you get a nosebleed, your nose hurts. If I tell you you're so ugly, you stop a clock, it hurts a lot more. Right? I mean, think about that. I can stand up here, I can turn my back to you and say something that will hurt you physically feel the pain. We've all felt the pain of somebody saying something to us that really hurt us. In this, how in the world does that work? What is it about these words that has that kind of power? What is it about these words that when we recite them absolutely perfectly, the rain, the monsoon rains come at the appropriate time? Or a son will be born to an infertile couple? Or the crops will be successful? There's power in these words beyond what we can understand. And so, the Indians became the greatest linguists, the greatest analyzers of language the world has ever known. These people wrote literature that is, in extent, far greater than the rest of the world understands. So if you take all of Greek and Latin combined and double it, it would begin to approximate the surviving literature in Sanskrit. And I say surviving because we know there are many, 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 many texts that are referred to that we've lost. It's very prolific. They wrote texts not only on ritual, but they wrote texts on law, mathematics, animal husbandry, physics, surprisingly sophisticated physics for its time. And every text that's written has commentaries and commentaries and commentaries on it. So the proliferation of Sanskrit literature is enormous.